Shall we pray? Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus because you are good, your mercies endure forever. Thank you because none can compare to you. We are grateful because we know that you are going to speak expressly to us today. We are confident that you have opened up secrets of this earth to us. And that's because of what you have in store for us. Help us not to miss it. And Lord, we take authority in the name of Jesus. We declare every distraction that can be as a result of anything or anyone is demobilized right now. Thank you for as our eyes make contact with the scriptures used in this message. Thank you for you open up our eyes and open up our hearts. Thank you for grace to live out your will in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good evening once again, Saz and Maz. I continue in the series, The Heart Mouth Connection. And very quickly, we will uh, just, there's a limit to how much we can recap for the sake of time, but we'll just try to, to run through what we said last week. Essentially, we began to look at the fact that God has put systems of advantage in place on this earth. And one of those systems of advantage is the fact that he has caused us to be made in his image, in his likeness. So to look like him and to be like him. That was what the devil sold to man unknowingly, not knowing that God had already made him in his image and likeness. And imagine buying what you already have. Isn't that the definition of, of a scam? God said, let us make man in our image, let him look like us, and in our likeness, let, let him have our similitudes, let him be like us. And the devil came and sold man that, and in essence, man lost that. But thank God for the privilege of being born again. And God is restoring us to this place of authority. And God is teaching us and showing us how we can create. We saw last week that the very first thing that the Bible lets us know about God is that in the beginning, God created. So God creates. And Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 says, be ye imitators of me as dear children. Be imitators of God. That, that is that Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 says. So if we are to imitate God, it means we should create just like he does. And that is not irreverent in any way. As a matter of fact, that is the intent and desire of God. That in our day-to-day -day lives, when we encounter challenges, when we encounter things that want to shape the outcomes of our lives, things that want to shape our experiences, things that want to shape our environment and circumstances, that we can also release this creative power that comes about like we, we, we saw last week, believing in our hearts, speaking with our mouth. And that when those two are in alignment, there is creative power released. We started out by looking at uh, the story of Jesus in Mark chapter 11, how that Jesus was hungry and how that because we know that God doesn't get hungry, this was God in the flesh, not God in his immortality, but God wrapped with mortality. So that, that means just like you and I, the Bible says that we have this earth thing, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. So, so the same way, way God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost without, without measure, the same way Jesus carried and hosted God within this mortal flesh, that's the same expectation for you and I. And the Bible tells us that Jesus was hungry and a hungry person wants to eat. And he walked up to this tree and uh, seeing it having leaves from afar, he expected to find something on it to eat. So Jesus will have plucked figs from it and eaten it. But when he got there, the, the Bible tells us that he found nothing. He found nothing. So what Jesus desired in his heart, when he got to the place where that desire would have been met, that desire was essentially uh, disappointed. Just like you and I, we experience disappointments from day to day. And Jesus, in response to that disappointment, said something. The Bible says he said it and the disciples heard him. Jesus said, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. I like that Jesus, and, and we, we touched on this in brief, in response, Jesus said something. I like how the Young's literal translation of this puts it. The Bible says that, and Jesus answered, that's the Young's literal translation uh, to the uh, right of your screen. The Bible says, and Jesus answered and said, let no one eat fruit of thee here, hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. So Jesus answered the tree. Jesus answered the tree. If you were there with Jesus, you wouldn't have heard anything. But the Bible tells us that Jesus answered. 
So getting to a point of your desire being met and meeting disappointment, you, we, we can hence normalize answering, answering, answering that medical report, answering that bank account statement. So your bank balance comes back and it's not only uh, uh, empty, it's in the negative. You are authorized by God to answer it, not just to think, not just to talk, but to answer in response, the Bible says. And the disciples heard it. Hallelujah. Uh, going on, we went on to see that Jesus, on his way back with his disciples, as they passed by that morning, they saw. So what Jesus said became visible. They saw that the fig tree had dried up from its roots. And Peter remembered and said, Master, look, the tree you have cursed has withered away. And Jesus replied to them, was have faith in God. We went on to see last week that in the literal, that is essentially have the faith of God or have the God kind of faith, as, as we saw in, in Young's literal translation. And, and you see, what, what, someone may, may, may wonder, you know, what, what's this thing about different transitions here and there? You see, the, 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 uh, a, a good example is, I think Afrikaans is, is, is a more literal language, but uh, Osa, I hope I got the click right, Sister Zimbo and Brother Pehelo. Isikosa is a very nuanced language. If you want to run into trouble, send a chat to somebody who is also speaking and use Google Translate. And the person will so laugh or either, or will either laugh or get angry because Google is unable to capture the nuances of it. A, a word I learned of recent in my place of work is okusalayo. Okusalayo sort of means uh, uh, eventually or after all is said and done, you know. But if you use Google Translate, Okusala will tell you the rest. That has the potential to mean a very different thing. So I, I'm saying this to say that translation um, is something that, is, that requires revelation. So sometimes taking a step back and looking at how it was put in the original can open up new light to one. So that's why we do this from time to time. So the Bible says, have the faith of God, or in other words, have the God kind of faith. And we went on to, to see in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, a place where faith, where, where God, in quote, uh, where God used faith, or where we saw the demonstration of the faith of God. That's, that's a better way to put it. We saw the demonstration of the faith of God. And the Bible tells us that by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. The worlds were called into existence by the word of God. The worlds were commanded by the word of God. So we see that the process of creation was a faith process and we see the demonstration of the faith of God at work. And like we mentioned earlier, the Bible tells us the first thing about God was that he, he, he created. And just like Jesus, when God was creating, the Bible tells us as is, as is in verse two that the earth was without form and void. So there was an undesirable circumstance. It was shapeless, it was formless, and it was without life. The Bible tells us that the Spirit of God hovered upon the waters. So the hovering of the Spirit of God is not a, a guarantee that things will automatically be as we desire them to be. You can cast your mind back to when Jesus was on the boat with the disciples. Jesus was there asleep, and they had to wake him up. Master, are you not, are, are you not concerned that we can drown in this thing? And Jesus woke up. So we can liken that to praying. They went to Jesus, said, Lord, look at this situation. Look at this circumstance. It is about to kill me. And Jesus reprimanded them. What did Jesus do? He spoke, peace be still. And another example comes to mind. Moses, when he was in front of the Red Sea, children of Israel behind him and Pharaoh's army was closing in on him. You know, he complained to God, ha ha, God, look at this. And God told him, why are you crying to me? Tell the children of Israel, to go forward. So there are many times that we, we, we pray. Now, this is, and we'll talk about that, you know, if, if God, God granting us help. We are not talking down prayer, but as sons and daughters, people who God has given responsibility on the earth, like we saw last week in, in Genesis chapter one, God has authorized us as speaking spirits to take authority. So when something happens, we said that Jesus, when he got to the fig tree and he didn't see figs, he didn't say, Father, you see your boy is hungry. You can even hear the sound of his belly. Ah, God provide. He didn't. He spoke. So there are times to pray. 
and there are times to say. There are times to pray and there are times to say. And God, in creating, said, let there be light and there was light. The Young Literal Translation puts it this way. You know, for the sake of time, we will have looked at so many more scriptures, but we're trying to just run through. The Young Literal Translation captures what is said here as let there be light. It says it more as let light be. Some of the more literal translations, as it's put in the original, will say light be. So God said light be. And I love the tenses of, of, of Young's literal translation. He says, and light is. If, 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 if you, you just want to do that exercise when you get back home, just look at Genesis chapter one and read it in, in Young's literal translation. As a matter of fact, make it a habit of looking at the literal lot. You will be surprised at the tenses that are in the Bible. Those tenses defy grammar. Those tenses defy logic. Those tenses make you see things in, in a new and real and, and fresh light. God said, let light be. And there was, gives the impression that it later happened. But he says, a light is. So the fact that God said it, it became reality. God said, let there be, a light is. And what God said, he saw. He saw that it was very good. Now, I put a very packed slide, and I may have to move out of the, the screen for us to be able to see it in full. So now, the Bible says, as it goes on, chapter 1, verse 11. My apologies if you have to squint into your screen or if you have to use your two fingers to make it wider. But I just want us to really capture this. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 11, the Bible says in verse 11, God said, let the grass come forth, and uh, it came forth. He said, let the herbs come forth, and they came forth. And uh, he, he went on. Uh, there was some, some space in between. He went on and he created man. So that beginning part, God created herbs. God created grass. He created trees. And he saw it. That was good. Verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image. And God made him in verse 27. Male and female, God made. And God blessed this man that he made them uh, as the bible says god blessed them and god said to them before from multiply not only did god bless them he went on to say to them see i have given you the herb those herbs i created in verse 11 and 12 verse 30 i've given you the birds and i've given you every green herb for food and so on and so forth verse 31 tells us that god god saw everything he had made it was good verse chapter 2 verse 1 going on says that and the host of all of them were finished. God had completed this work. Verse 2, God it says again, God ended the work which he had done. And verse 3, God rested from all the work he had done. Verse 4, and this is the history of the heavens. That word history there is the same word that is used as genealogy. You know, when... Um, the Bible talks in Genesis chapter 6 about the genealogy of, of, of Adam or going on the genealogy of, of, of Noah. So this is now looking at history from a human standpoint. From the divine standpoint, God had finished it. From the human standpoint, the Bible says in, in, in uh, verse 4, then verse 5, before there was any plant, but God had, come, had created them in verse 11. And it goes on to say that there was no man to till the ground, but God made man in verse 27 to 29. As a matter of fact, not only did God make man, he gave man those herbs. But here we are just seeing it manifest. And it tells us now that God formed man. Oh, so it is possible for something to be created before it gets formed. So it's possible that I can say things and because my, my words are lying, I create them, but don't have form. They don't have tangibility in this mortal realm. They don't have uh, um, width, length, height, and depth. That tells us that God planted a garden even though he had finished it all there. So, then in verse 31, God said, and he saw everything that he had made. What God was seeing, and what you, a natural man, if you're standing there, were seeing, would be totally different. And we established this last week. So now let's go back to our anchor scripture, Mark 11, the God kind of faith. Whoever says to this mountain, 
be removed because in Lucy does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things which he says will be done, he will have what he says. So we established last week that God kind of faith says. The God kind of faith not only says, but believes that what he says will come to pass. And this kind of faith that we see demonstrated in Genesis 1, we see Jesus explain to us in uh, Matthew, um, sorry, Mark 11, when he says and believes that those things which he says will come to pass, he will have what he says. So realities are created by that kind of faith. I went to look at Romans chapter um, 10, verse 6, and how it's used many times in the context of salvation. The heart and the mouth, believing in the heart, confessing with the mouth, and one experiences salvation. And we ended by saying that bringing the desired from the realm of the spirit into the material requires this heart-mouth alignment. It was taken from this portion. Uh, Paul, speaking by the Spirit of God, was actually quoting Deuteronomy chapter 30. And here Moses was saying to the children of Israel. So, so that you just, uh, this was, so you see the context that we didn't just take that scripture context last week that you know we say whoever believes in his heart and confesses with his mouth to be saved. That's talking about salvation. But it's just highlighting a principle in scripture. And you know, for the sake of time, we'll have shown us scripture upon scripture upon scripture upon scripture that highlights this principle about saying, believing what you say, and it becoming a reality. Now, Moses was telling the children of Israel here, this is what Paul quoted in Romans chapter 10. And he says that the commandment that I'm giving you is not too mysterious. This thing is not difficult. It's not spooky. It is not far off from heaven. It is not far beyond the sea. Paul, quoting the instrument, now said, you know, it's not far into hell because of the context of using it with Jesus and salvation. He says it's near you in your heart and your mouth. Verse 15 says, in the same vein, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. Verse 19 says, life and death, blessing and cursing, choose life. So in this same context was where he said this. Now, if you're already thinking about chapter 20, verse 20, that death and life, the Bible tells us, are in the power of the tongue. So you see that this confirms the point that Believing in your heart, confessing in your mouth will create reality. And it's as serious as death and life. Hallelujah. Now to what we have to touch on today, which is very brief. And I, I, I believe that this is at the instruction of God. Uh, 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 Matthew chapter 15, verse 8 to 9. <clears throat> God was, was saying here, yeah, Jesus was saying it, quoting the Old Testament in Psalm 75 to be precise. And he said that these people draw near to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So we have been talking about the heart-mouth connection. This here shows us a heart-mouth disconnection. So it is possible that, you know, we touched on it last week. And if, if you just cast your mind to the scripture we just read now, Deuteronomy chapter 30, that Moses was saying that I have set before you life and death. Choose. So it means that this same principle of being in your heart heart and your mouth can not only work for you, it can work against you. Last week, we talked about the fact that a person has a tendency, and the devil is strategic about it, that you many more times you believe negative things when you say them, or rather when you say negative things, you believe them. But when it's something that is you know, positive in line with God's word, we sometimes struggle to believe it. When I tell you that COVID is dangerous, I know my heart, my heart, because I have seen, I've experienced people walking by people. I have seen a colleague in the hospital where I was just going to greet him, social distancing greeting, him, just with an elbow jab. But as my elbow was approaching him, I, I noticed that he wasn't bringing his elbow to me. 
And I looked at him and, you know, with, with all the mask and visor and everything, nowadays we know how to read things with our eyes. And when I saw his eyes, I knew that, ah, like we say in Nigeria, I packed well. I just packed well that, ah, what's going on here? I now paid attention well, and I saw who he was willing. And the patient he was willing was struggling for life. Had a very, um, a new fancy kind of ventilator. So it wasn't too evident. You know, I just saw him standing by the elevator. So that's why I didn't initially pay attention to who was in front of him. This person was struggling for their life. Later when I saw him, he was telling me that in his mouth, like this guy, don't just come near me. Don't come near me. If you see, if you see the big, <laughs> big, the big trouble that is in front of me here. And the guy was working in the COVID world that time. So he, he was a risk to everybody around him. So when I say that you better take the vaccine, my heart agrees with my mouth because of what my eyes have seen. But if it is the circumstance, you know, of saying that with certainty, God heals the sick, I believe it. Now you say, no, God cannot be sick. I will argue with you from morning to night. What do you mean? Have you seen this in scripture? Have you seen that? Have you seen that? I've experienced that. But let's bring it a little closer. You tell me that God will heal this man that I'm looking at with that ventilator. All my medical knowledge now starts to filter. Hmm. Honestly, God that can save this one. At that point, my heart and my mouth are no longer agreeing. You see? So I, I'm saying this to say that we, we, we find it easier to agree with our hearts when it's something negative. Whereas when it's positive, it takes effort and work. And that's why God is highlighting this to us, for us to train ourselves in this regard. And the tool that God is bringing to the fore today, I believe that after fellowship last week, as I got into my room, those two words came clearly to my heart. It was engaging joy. Engaging joy. And what on earth does joy have to do with all of this that we're talking about? We're talking about Believing in your heart, confessing with your mouth. Let's see what scripture has to say. Isaiah chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. In that day, you will say, Oh Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away, you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For yeah, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has also become my salvation. He is my strength and my song. He has also become my salvation. He has also become my salvation. And it goes on to say, therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. With joy, joy, the two, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. So there are wells of salvation. Thinking about scripture, you, you can think already about Jesus saying that the water is Give him what is God Jesus said to the woman by the well, John chapter 4. The water that I give him will be in him a well. So there are wells of salvation. And the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, with joy. Joy is the tool that you would use to draw water from this well of salvation. So in, in the times that what you desire is out of reach. If you've ever fetched water before, you, you can see that the water is there. You, you can even be thirsty. You may need water in the house. But without something to fetch with, that water can be there. You will be there with the need, but there will be no connect. Just like how Jesus could be in front of the fig tree, hungry. But the fig tree is there with leaves. But still he is hungry because there are no fruits. Just like how God can, can be uh, present. And he is a God who creates, but the world around is null and void. That same way you can be in the presence of water and be thirsty. But he says with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Now, Mark chapter 11, verse 23, like we have seen before. But now the Bible says that whoever says to this mountain, right, mouth, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will be done, what he says will happen. He will have what he says. And look, looking at Hebrews chapter one, the Bible tells us what, 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 what faith is. We're talking about the, the, the faith of God or the God kind of faith, excuse me. And it says that this faith is confidence 
in what we hope for. Now, believing in your heart that what you say will be done. You, 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 if you want to be realistic, you see how? How can I be sure and certain that what I say will happen to the point of now believing it? How am I not deceiving myself? I don't have any assurance in quotes, but the Bible tells us that you can have assurance of what you don't see. I like the amplified version that says, it is not only the assurance, it is the confirmation. It is the title deed. It is like you've paid it to have the receipts. It's like receiving the alert on your phone from the bank. You, by receiving that, you can release a good to a person without having seen the cash. The Bible calls faith proof. It is the proof that the things we do not see, we can be convinced of their reality. We can perceive as a real fact the things that are not revealed to the senses. Like we said in Genesis chapter one, that if you were there with God, if your eyes were open in the natural, what you will be seeing is that the earth is null and void. You will see that darkness is upon the face of the deep. And you will see that God is saying, let there be and light be and light is, which is, as far as I can see, it is darkness. It's not revealed to my senses. Or just like you were there with Jesus and he was in front of the fig tree and Jesus said, no man eat fruit from you ever again. And the tree is still standing in front of you. As a matter of fact, the tree can even move in the wind to show you that I'm alive and well. But as Jesus has released that word, as far as it's concerned, it is, is reality. And Jesus explaining the scenario that happened there was saying that if at that point you are in front of this tree and you say this, you must believe in your heart that what you are saying will be done. That's what you will have it. So Jesus is saying that you, to have conviction of things that are not revealed to the senses. And you and I, I'm sure you have been faced with situations where your senses are screaming at you, telling you that is a lie, it will not happen. Where your senses are telling you that you have failed, accept it, you have failed, accept it. This is one time that your God has failed you. Agree, accept it that you will not have children, accept it. The people that don't have children, do they, do they have two heads? Accept it. Accept it that this is how you will keep living from hand to mouth, accept it. But as Jesus answered, as Jesus replied, and by reason of his reply, the next day when they came, they saw that the tree was dried up from the roots dried up from the roots. God is specific in when, when he, with his use of words, dried up from the roots. If something, you see, the root is the place that is closest to resource. So if trouble should start, it should start from the place that is farthest from resource. It should start drying from the leaves and then the branches and then the stem to the roots. But the Bible tells us that from the roots. So Jesus' word went to the bottom of the matter, to the foundation of the matter and started to take effect. So if you were there, judging just by the sight of your eyes or by the hearing of your ears, you have missed the point. Because you can have assurance, you can have confirmation, you can have conviction of this reality. But you may be here and saying that, Fantastic, great, great word, great word. In fact, you are shouting and your neck beans are popping out. Good, 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 good. But it's not happening for me like that. It's a struggle. How do I disregard what I'm seeing? Now, if I want to be churchy, I'll say, no, disregard it and just believe God. Just believe God. I will end and you will go home. But God has put tools in place to help us. Remember we said last week that Jesus is God in touch. God who can feel what it feels to be in this mental body. So Jesus telling them that was not to leave them hanging. He went on to explain it. Let's see verse 24. He says, therefore, 
So because of this, I say to you, therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask, some translations say whatever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. What, 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 what is the issue about this? Jesus said, the things you desire, when you pray, again, this principle of heart and mouth, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Not what Jesus did not say. Jesus did not say, believe that you will receive them and you will have them. He said, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Are we just playing with tenses? If there's nothing you, you, you pick from today, pick the fact that tenses in scripture are important. Let's look at another translation and see what it says here. Amplified. For this reason I'm telling you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe, trust, and be confident that it is granted to you. Believe that you receive. And then you will get it. So there is something that happens at the point of my speaking, at the point of my praying, where it is put as done so that I can receive what it will be. Let's look at one more translation, the NIV. Therefore, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have, you have received it, past tense, and it will be yours. So, this is where I'm going. That there is a difference between receiving and having. And again, if you've been following, you can draw a parallel between Jesus speaking to the tree and Bible gives us the back story of that. It means he believed in his heart that what he said would come to pass. So he had received it. And when they were coming back the next day and saw it dried up, that was when he had it. Genesis chapter one. Jesus, uh, God, creating heaven and earth, speaking, speaking, and he was speaking, he was, speaking, he was seeing. He were, if you were there, you wouldn't have seen it. In a sense, we can say it was received. Genesis chapter two, when it started materializing, was the having. So there is a difference between receiving and having. And now let's see examples all through scripture of people who, to prove that there is a difference between receiving and having. And why this is important. Why, when I stand before something, I count it as done before it materializes. And where joy fits into the scripture. Jonah chapter one. Jonah, before this point, had disobeyed God. He was in a ship. The ship was being wrecked. They threw him overboard. And by throwing him overboard, they were saved. And a fish swallowed him. Verse 17 on, on your screen. Now the Lord God provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And where was Jonah? In the belly of the fish from three days and three nights. Chapter two, verse one. Where did Jonah pray from? From inside the fish. Jonah prayed. So this prayer was the prayer of Jonah from inside the fish. Remember that you have received and then you will have. So receiving is something that happens at the point you are praying. Believe that, that, that is to say, believing in your heart is the thing that, that is referred to as receiving, laying a hold of. And that is the prerequisite uh, alongside releasing words with your mouth that will make it manifest. Jonah chapter two, verse two. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord. Which one are you talking about? The one we don't know about or the one you are inside, sir? And he answered me, answered you. Where are you praying from? Inside the belly of the fish. In fact, he let you know that he's not the solution. From the deep. In the realm of the dead, I called for help. <laughs> and you listened to my cry. You hurled me from the depths, 
from the very heart of the sea where the current swelled over me. Sir, the currents are swelling over you right now. And all your waves and breakers swept over me. When did this happen? As far as I'm concerned, that's your current address. Oh, I said, I have been banished from your sight. Yet I will look again to your holy temple. The waters engulfed me, the deep surrounded me, seaweed wrapped around my head. It is around your head now. The roots of the mountains where I sank, and so on and so forth. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, and I prayed to your holy temple, and so on and so, so forth. Verse 9, but with shouts of grateful praise, I will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And then, this person who was praying this way had received what he was asking about. Because in the middle of his distress, he was seeing it as though it had, it had passed. In my distress, I called to the Lord. Sir, that is what you should be doing right now. But he's seeing it as though it had happened. But in case you miss the attitude that he's saying it with, he explains it in verse 9. With shouts of grateful praise. So in the midst of the belly of the fish, Jonah was, was rejoicing. I, I was distressed. And I called the Lord. And he rescued me. Sir, are you mad? You are indeed distressed right now. Well, that's what it means to have received. We see here the example of David. For time's sake, I need to, to run very quickly. David was in front of, the, of, of Goliath. Goliath saw that he was just a little boy, verse 42, and he despised him. Mistake. Mistake. Despised the person who has learned the principle of aligning his heart with his mouth. And when it is difficult to do because of what your eyes can see, the tool you can engage is the tool of joy. And you start to speak about your current circumstance as it, as it, was, it was passed. And David said, even after Goliath had said, David was not quiet. He answered, he responded. And he says that this day, I will, the Lord will deliver you to my hands and I will cut off your head. Cut off your head. And the Bible says in verse 50, so David triumphed over the Philistine with the sling and a stone without a sword in his hand. And he said it. He believed in his heart. He said in his mouth that he would cut off his head. David ran, took his sword, and cut off his head with his own sword. So I'm saying that we should normalize talking about what God has done as though it had happened in the past. The Bible talks about Abraham in Romans chapter 4, that Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthening in faith. How? Giving glory to God. Being fully persuaded that what God had promised was also able to perform. So you can build persuasion with the tool of joy. You, you can face something that you feel like what I'm saying, I'm just talking. My heart is not connected with my words. You know what? Take some time out and rejoice. Write it on a piece of paper. Three zero. This is something that I did in, 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 in my undergraduate days. A particular exam was staring me in the face. There were three papers you needed to pass to move to the next level. And I would write it three zero and I'll put it on the ground and I would dance around it. I will rejoice. I will give praise to the point where it becomes a settled reality in my heart. That as we saw in Hebrews chapter one, I'm assured, I'm confident. I have the title deed. I have received it. It's as real to me as the shirt on my back. And when I open my mouth and release words, because my mouth is aligned with my heart, I am creating realities. If, 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 if you, next year, we're going to be seven years in, in, in marriage. Our first daughter is going to be four. If you do the math, you will see that there was a period of waiting. And in that period of waiting, the, the, one of the last few things I remember was that my, my wife will, around the house, there were things that were written about our children, about our children, when they had we not seen one, where well, they are about to be children now. Praise God. I remember driving from Ibarra to Isengi, and in the car, rejoicing so much in the fact that I was a father. And the only words that could come out of my mouth were, me, daddy, me, daddy. I was so excited. It's not just fanaticism. It's engaging the tool of joy. To get your heart to accept what God has done. You accept it as done. That like Jonah, you can pray about it in the past tense. The Bible talks about Sarah. Sarah, the, the, the Bible tells us that when, when the angel said, this time next year you have a child, she laughed. She laughed, so she was in unbelief. But her story does not end there. Hebrews 11, 11. The Bible says, Sarah herself received strength to conceive. So something happened between when Sarah doubted and the manifestation of Isaac. 
Sarah received strength to conceive, for she judged him faithful. She looked at second time, she looked at God. She looked at second time, she looked at God. But something happened that made her look at second time, look at God, and say, I judged God faithful. The Bible tells us about Joshua, the children of Israel, they were in front of a wall. The wall was as, as high as it was wide. People built houses on that wall. But they went around and went around and went around and went around. The Bible told them to keep quiet. So they attempt to be quiet and build up capacity in you. They attempt to be quiet and not engage in discussions about it. They attempt to just go around and go around and go around the situation. Go around it. But building up capacity inside. That as when Joshua told them to release a shout for God has given them the victory. They did and the walls came crumbling down. The Bible tells us about Jesus. He was faced with lack. There was a need. Thousands of people needed to eat. Just a few loaves bread and fish. Jesus took it, broke it, and gave thanks. And what was not enough became more enough. He's saying to us today, engage the tool of joy. James chapter 1, count it all joy. When you go through diverse temptations, trials, tests, knowing that it is for the perfecting of your faith, engage the tool of joy this week. This week, rejoice over the things that give you pain. This week, Rejoice over the things that have defied you in the face. This week, take out time to thank God. Hallelujah.